we are, for the first time, uh, kind of going, going uh, in, in, a, in a, different, a different format. And so many of you guys at home and many of you guys um, on your phones or on your televisions joining along, and we're glad that you have. Um, one of the things that uh, I, I've kind of addressed in these last week, and, and, I, and I think some of those pertinent things, you know, as we go through uh, a pandemic, as, you know, we're, we're kind of dealing with things that we've never had to deal with before. And I think the, the very first thing that kind of got my attention was the fear that was being um, brought upon uh, the, 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 the masses. And so we, we addressed the, the issue of fear last week as we looked at Psalm 46 and reminded that God is our refuge. And I love this. He says he's a very present help in trouble. And so if, if maybe you're still dealing with fear and, and you missed last Sunday, man, I encourage you to go back. You can pick it up on uh, one of the feeds on, on YouTube or Facebook. But also, um, this week, I, I've been getting a lot of, fielding a lot of questions and people asking, you know, well, well you know, what, what does this, all this mean? What, what, what kind of, um, uh, for the future, where is this in prophecy? And well, what, what does this look like? You know, have we begun the tribulation period? I mean, you know, I, I've gotten all kinds of those kinds of um those kinds of questions. And I, what I want to do this morning, and maybe you're getting those questions. Maybe some family and friends are going, you know, what, what does the Bible say about all of this stuff? And so what I wanted to do, and, and not so much putting the attention on, you know, the signs and wonders. I'll, we'll, we'll touch that real quick. But, uh, or, or the signs and, you know, the, the, the trials and tribulations. But what really I, I wanted to do is look at how do we respond to this thing and to what we're going through. In, in, in our day. And so um, I think Jesus uh, really helps put things in perspective in, in Matthew chapter 24. And, and again, we're, we're just going to look at that passage. Jesus had told the disciples that the temple was going to be destroyed. And in their mind, the temple being destroyed meant that the end of the world was there. And so they had come to Jesus and they pulled him aside privately and they asked him, uh, you know, what, when, you know, what are you talking about? When's this all going to happen? In Matthew 24, three, Jesus says this, that he sat on the Mount of Olives and the disciples came to him privately and they were saying, tell us when will these things be and what will be the sign of your coming and the end of the age? And Jesus answered them and he said, take heed that no one deceive you. For many will come in my name saying, I am the Christ and will deceive many. Notice the first thing that Jesus warns against. He says, deception is going to be out there. And there's going to be a lot of people wanting to kind of pull you away from truth. And the very first thing Jesus warns about, he says, look, many are going to come in my name. They're going to, they're going to come and they're going to say they represent me, but they're not going to be representing me. They're going to, they're going to deceive you, right? So the, the, there's the first warning. But then notice what Jesus says um, there in verse 6. He says, and you're going to hear of wars, rumors of wars. See that you are not troubled. For all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nation will rise up against nation and kingdom against kingdom. And there will be famines and pestilence and earthquakes in various places. And all of these things are the beginning of sorrows. Or it could also be translated, all of these things are birth pangs. And, and, and what we know about birth pangs is that the, these things kind of, you know, become... Um, once they begin, you know, it becomes more frequent, it becomes more intense, and it becomes, you know, something that you know that it's going to happen, right? Once the birth pangs start, a baby's coming, right? You, you're just kind of like, well, we'll just kind of, you know, take a vacation or something. No, you start birth pangs, start heading to the hospital, right? Knowing that the water's going to break and then everything else is, it, it, it's all going to happen and it's going to happen shortly, and Jesus says, look, all of these things are going to happen. The nation's going to rise up against nations, kingdom against kingdom. And then there's going to be famines. And then there's going to be pestilence and then earthquakes. Now, one of the things, that, and I just kind of, you know, you start going, all of these things kind of accumulating together should kind of get our attention. 
right? We start to see pestilence. We're, we're in the middle of a, a worldwide pestilence, a, a virus that's, that is spread throughout the nations. It's, it's not just happening, guys, in, in the United States. It's not just happening in Italy. It's not just happening in China. Guys, this is a global pandemic. I, I was on the phone yesterday with... Um, one of our missionaries out in Peru, and they're in the jungles. Not one case of coronavirus has hit the jungles of Peru. Many have, uh, have it in, in other parts of Lima, but not one, one verified case in the jungles of Peru, and they're on lockdown in the middle of nowhere, in the middle of the jungles. And he says, just all, all the restaurants have closed. You know, it, it's, everyone has been told, stay in their house. And you're, you're talking a jungle city of about 500,000 roughly uh, in, 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 in the middle of, of nowhere and they're being impacted and affected. And those guys live literally from day to day. They, they, they literally, today's food they go to work for for that day and be able to provide for their families and, they, and, and, it's, and it's affected them. So we're, we're, we're watching pestilence take place. It's, it's interesting that um, famines is, is, is used in that passage. I, I was reading an article about the swarms of locusts that are going through Africa, the Middle East, and India. And, and they're saying it's going to cause um, in, incredible, um, uh, you know, hunger throughout that whole region, especially in Africa and, and in India, because the locusts are literally devouring all of the crops, Interesting. I mean, that's happening at the same time. You know, all this other stuff is going on on top of this pandemic. I, I was reading a, another article. In the, in the last five days, there's been five earthquakes at 5.0 or greater. That was interesting. I mean, that, that, that's a little abnormal. Five of 5.0 or greater. One of those was centered in Utah. was a 5.7. And, and th- th- this, was, this was what blew my mind. It got my attention. At the center of um, Utah, there in Salt Lake City, is a Mormon temple. And in the Mormon temple, the trumpet on top of that temple is is an angel, Moroni, and he's got a trumpet blowing, and this is what blew my mind, is that the earthquake dislodged the trumpet and it fell from Moroni's um, hands. That just... To me, significant. You kind of go, is God trying to say something? Is, is God trying to get attention? Right? And, and so you, you, you look at all of these things and, and, and you realize that, you know, we could be very well living in the birth pangs. And I think that's where we're at. If you were to kind of go, where, where are we at? We're in the birth pangs. And it looks like they're, they're kind of intensifying. It looks like they're kind of increasing uh, day by day. And, and, you know, last week I told you guys, hey, we're going to meet because they said if there's 50 or more, we'll be able to meet. We already had a whole, a whole plan. We're going to meet in 50 places, the 50 throughout the whole church, outside. I mean, we, we already had a, a whole scheme of how that was going to look like. And then Monday morning, the president gets on and he says, hey, we can't meet in more than 10 in a group. And we thought, okay, there goes that idea. Right, things are changing by the minute. We we don't know what 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 is the announcement next Monday, right? Or what what's going to happen a week from now or a month from now? Or you know what does this this all look like? And I found a passage in, in the book of First Thessalonians. is found in, in in the fifth chapter, First Thessalonians chapter five. And that's where we're going to look at this morning because it was a church that was asking the same questions. It was a church that, that really was, uh, you know, asking, you know, did we miss the rapture? Is there um, going to be God's wrath being poured out upon us? And is, is, that, is that the season or the time that we're living in? And so in chapter 5, Paul addresses that particular question to a church that was, was a, a little bit shaken concerning those things. And so we're, we're going we're gonna to read uh, the first 11 verses, and then we'll come back and we'll expound upon those. Notice uh, there in verse 1, he says, But concerning the times and the seasons, brethren, you have no need that I should write to you. 
For you yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so comes as a thief in the night. And when they say peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes upon them as labor pains upon a pregnant woman, and they shall not escape. But you, brethren, are not in darkness, so that that day should overtake you as thief. You are sons of the light and sons of the day. We are not of the night nor of darkness. Therefore, let us not sleep as others do. Let us watch and be sober. For those who sleep, they sleep at night. And those who get drunk are drunk at night. But let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and of love. And as a helmet, the hope of salvation. For God did not appoint us to wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, that whether we wake or sleep, we should, be, we should live together with him. Therefore, comfort each other and edify one another, just as you also are doing. I love that passage. I, I love the passage because Paul, Paul, in this passage, he reminds them, hey, this is true. This is going to happen. This is what's going to go down, but it's not there yet. And then he tells them what they need to be doing in the meantime. And, and, I, and, I, and I think that's really the message that we need to hear in the days that we're living in. That even though we're, we're, we're not in the tribulation period, this isn't the beginning of God's wrath upon the world. I, I believe that this is God trying to get the attention not only of the unbeliever, but I think he's trying to get the attention of the church. I think he's trying to wake us up. And it, this is what, what's interesting. Notice what Paul said there in verse one. He says, concerning the times and the seasons, brethren, you have no need that I should write to you. And it wasn't because Paul was saying, you don't need to know these things. He says, because I've already told you these things. Notice what he said in verse 2. For you yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord doesn't, uh, so comes as a thief in the night. You know these things. When Paul was there in Thessalonica, one of the things that he taught them and sat with them and explained to them was the events of the last days. He was teaching them about the day of the Lord. And he says, so the times and seasons are, are, are something that, that's our, you know, that, that you guys are aware of. Now, th those are two interesting phrases, the times and seasons. What are, what are the times that we're living in? What are the seasons that we go through? And, and here, here's, here's what's, what's interesting, guys. We're living in times where we're seeing all of the signs, right? The signs of the times. We're seeing it all. It looks like we may have begun a whole new season now. <laughs> things are different. Things are changing globally. Things are changing uh, on a scale that, that is, you know, beyond our ability to, to grasp. What's interesting is that Daniel, in Daniel chapter 2, that Daniel's in a, a, a prophetic book, and, and Daniel chapter 2 and verse 20 he used that same term. Watch what he says in Daniel 2.20. Daniel answered and said, Blessed be the name of God forever and ever, for wisdom and might are his. Watch this. And he changes the times and the seasons. He removes kings and raises up kings. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to those who have understanding. He reveals deep and secret things. He knows what is in the darkness and light dwells with him. You see, da da Daniel declared, look, let me tell you something. God is the one who knows the times and the seasons. He's in control of the times and the seasons. And he's the one who's allowing the things that happen to happen. And he's the one who puts up kings and takes down kings. You see, in, in every arena, God's on the throne. In all of the times and seasons. And when the seasons change, because God has declared it or allowed it to change. And so we, I think that's great comfort. It's interesting, in, in the book of Acts chapter 1, when Jesus uh, was with the disciples and, and he was uh, 
Again, you know, encouraging them before his uh, ascension into heaven in Acts chapter 1 and verse 6, that same term's used again. And there in Acts 1 and 6, it says this, therefore, when they had come together, they asked him saying, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom of Israel? And Jesus said, it is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father has put into his own authority. Again, what, what is Jesus doing? Look, that, that's God's business the times and the seasons, when all of this is going down. We know this, guys. We, we know that Jesus is going to come back and he's going to establish a kingdom that he will reign supreme. And all of these things are leading up until that moment. He's, he's going to come and he's going he's to rule the earth with a righteous judgment. And all of these things are, are, are just preparing us for that. It's, it's the birth pangs before it finally happens, the day of the Lord. And when he uses that phrase, the day of the Lord, he's not talking about a moment. He's talking about, you know, a, a period of time. And it seems that the church being taken out of here is what's going to ignite that period of time. The day of the Lord. Right now we're living the day of man. <laughs> One day there's coming the day of the Lord and God is going to deal with, the, with, with all of the, the wrong and injustice and evil and he's going to deal with all of the, the, the craziness that, that, that we're experiencing. It's, it's, it's in, in the book of Isaiah chapter 9. We, we know this passage every, every, every Christmas. We, we pull out this passage Isaiah chapter nine, verse six, and, and we read it and we, and, and we think of that little baby Jesus that came, but watch, 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 watch Isaiah nine, six. It says, for unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulder. His name will be called Wonderful and Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Watch this. Of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. Upon the throne of David and over his kingdom, to order it, to establish it with judgment and with justice from that time forward, even forevermore, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this like that. He reminds us, he just reminds us very simply, look, that moment when Jesus comes and establishes his kingdom, it's going to be an everlasting kingdom. There's going to be no end to it, and he's going to rule and he's going to reign. And then what's interesting there in verse 2, he says, you know perfectly that the day of the Lord so comes, how? As a thief in the night. It's going to come unexpectedly. It's, it's, it's going to come j just like, you know, a thief would come. There's not going to be a, a warning. There's not going to be some kind of, uh, uh, you know, marker that you're going to go, oh, when this happens, then I know the thief's going to. No, it's, it's going to be like a thief in the night. It's, it's just going to happen. And so what was Paul's encouragement? He says, when the day of the Lord comes, it, it's going it's to come just kind of in, in a sudden way. And, and if, if you go and study that, and, and we, we won't turn there today, but if you want to go read about the day of the Lord, it's going to be a time where God is going to bring his judgment and his wrath upon the world. In the book of Isaiah chapter 13, if you're taking notes, Isaiah 13, 6 all the way to verse 13, man. Go read those chap that chapter because that chapter talks about birth pangs once again. There in verse, in verse eight, it says, and they will be afraid, pangs and sorrows will take hold of them. They will be in pain as a woman in childbirth. They will be amazed at one another. Their faces will be like flames. I mean, th he's talking about the day of the Lord. And if you go through that passage, it'll blow your mind because he's laying out, look, there is coming a time when, you know, all of these things are going to happen. It's going to be like, like a thief in the night when it happens. Now, notice uh, what, what he says there in verse 3. It says, for they say, when they say peace and safety, 
When they say everything's going to be, oh, everything's just great, everything's good, it could be that he's talking about this, this time period when the Antichrist is going to come into power and he's going to try to bring order to everything. And for the first three and a half years, it's going to be everything's going just great. And then all of a sudden, he goes into the temple and he declares himself to be Messiah, right? And, and it, it, it could be reference to that, but he says, that, and then all of a sudden, what? Sudden destruction comes upon them as labor pains upon a pregnant woman and they shall not escape it. So he lays out for, you know, the church there. Look, the, these things are gonna happen. All these things are leading up to something. Jesus is going to rule. He's going to reign. He's going he's to come and establish his kingdom. And, and, you know, God is going to judge the world that's rejected his grace and his love and his mercy. All those things are going to happen. But that's not what's happening right here. And, and I, 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 would, I would think that's the very same thing that, that Paul would declare to us today, that the scripture would declare to us now, that, you know what, all, all these things are happening. We're, it's all heading that way for sure. But that's not what we're experiencing as of yet. But you, I like that, but you. Now he's saying, you know, even though that's, that's where we're heading, guys, what do we do now as a result of all these things? But you, brethren, you're not in darkness so that that day should overtake you as a thief. In other words, if you're, you know, in this relationship with the Lord, you're walking with the Lord, you're living a life of obedience to the Lord, you're in the word, you're in prayer. He says, you're not going to be taken by surprise like the rest of the world's going to be taken by surprise when all of this goes down. You're, you're not going to be, uh, you know, in that position where you think, you know what, uh, everything's just great and then all of a sudden it happens because you're not in darkness. You're not living your life in darkness. You're, you're, you're not, um, you know, living your life in, in, in delusional, you know, or, or, or in, in, this, in this drunken state. And so he reminds them, look, you're not in darkness. You, you, you are, are um, you know, aware of what's going on around you. And I think it's important that we're aware. I think it's important that, you know, we're kind of watching everything. I, I don't know about you guys, but I, you know, I, I'm pretty much glued to, you know, the, the news and, okay, what's going to happen next? And you know, I'm, I'm watching like never before. I, I'm kind of, you know, minute by minute, just kind of, okay, what happened next? What's going to happen next? And, you know, it just kind of, just, you just realize that, you know, we're living in very interesting times. And so it causes us to kind of have our antennas up a little bit more than, than we'd normally have our antennas up. No, notice, notice what he says in verse 5. He says, you're sons of the light. And your sons of the day were not of the night nor of darkness. And what he does in that one passage, is he, he declares there's two kingdoms. There, there's those that are living in darkness and those who are living in light. There, there's those that are living, you know, this life that, you know, daylight and, and, and you know, light are, are what's, what, what's, what's permeating them and directing them. And there's those that are living in total uh, darkness and, and they actually um, enjoy the night. <laughs> and that, 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 what, what that's a reference to is, is like, you know, a, a separation from God. The, the, God is not part of their equation. God's not part of their thought. God's not part of their, 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 their uh, you know, their, their pursuit. It's just, we're, we're just living our life, you know, separated from God, or you're those that are living your life, you know, in tune with what God is doing and what God is declaring and what God is saying. And then comes the application. He says, understand there's two kingdoms, and he says, therefore... Therefore, let us not sleep. I'm sorry, verse, verse seven, the, 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 there it is. Therefore, let us not sleep, verse, verse six, that is, as others do, but let us watch and be sober. Now, it's, it's interesting that he uses this word 
sleep here. He says, let us, and, and notice he's, he's, he's including, you know, the, the church into this. Let us not sleep. The word sleep means to be indifferent, to yield to sloth or to yield to sin, to be indifferent to one salvation. He goes, look, church, don't fall into that category where you're actually sleeping right in the middle of all of the things that are going on around you. And I, I, that's why I'm convinced. I'm, I'm convinced that God is allowing these things to kind of shake up, kind of wake up. Those that maybe have become a little sleepy in their Christian walk or in their Christian life, He's kind of just saying, hey, hey, it, it, it's not time to be slumbering. It's not time to be sleeping. It, it's, it's not time to be drunk right now. It's, it's time to, to put on, you know, truth and light and, and to be in tune with what God wants to do. He uses that, that idea a second time. It's, it's there in Luke chapter 21. This time it's not the apostle Paul, but it's Jesus himself. In Luke chapter 21 and verse 34, watch what Jesus declares. He says, take heed to yourselves, lest your hearts be weighed down with carousing and drunkenness and the cares of this life, and that day come on you unexpectedly. For it will come as a snare on all those who dwell on the face of the whole earth. Watch therefore and pray always that you may be counted worthy to escape all these things that, you will, come, that will come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man. Guys, this is Jesus telling the very same thing that Paul would tell in the church of Thessalonica. He's now telling, you know, the disciples, watch and be ready. Don't let the cares of this world, you know, distract you or weigh you down so that you're missing out on what God is doing in the days that you're living in. And it's, it's an incredible picture here because what, what he's asking the church to do here, he says, look, you, you, you're, you're not to be like those who sleep. You're, you're to be awakened in all of this stuff. You're to be watching and you're to live a life that's sober. That, that word sober is also a very interesting word because the, the, the word really speaks of being self-controlled. It's to control, um, to curb the controlling influences or in, inordinate emotions or desires conceived of a sobering up from the influence of alcohol. That's the picture. He says, you, you know, you, you just kind of come out of your stupor. You kind of come out of your, your drunken state and you become, you know, clearer and clearer and clearer in your thinking and clearer and clearer in, you know, what is happening around you. And, and what's, what's interesting, he's saying, look, watch and be sober. And as you're watching all of this stuff happen, it should cause us to sober up in, in, the, in a sense that, man, we, we, we need to, you know, dive deep into truth, you know, make sure our lives are lined up with, 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 with God's word and hanging out, you know, with those that are going to encourage us in that direction. And this is what he's asking the church. He's asking the, the, the church to do and the church to, to do. Check, check this out. And I love this. Look at verse 7. He says, for those who, sleep at, those who sleep, sleep at night, and those who get drunk are drunk at night. But let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love and as a helmet the hope of salvation. And then notice he uses... Um, Two, two really different pictures here. If you, if you remember when we were reading that first part, he says, look, this is going to happen to them. This is how they are going to respond. This is, this is how they're going to act. It, it, it's, it, it was never us. Now he's saying, let us, let us, let us walk soberly. Let us, who are of the day, be sober. Notice what he said there uh, in verse 8. He says, not only be sober, but you were to what? We're to be putting on the breastplate of faith and love. Guys, 
Anytime you're going to put a breastplate on, that means that you're in a battle. Right? You, 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 don't, you don't put a flak jacket on unless you plan on going into the line of fire. And that's the picture here. We're, we're in the line of fire. Therefore, you have to put on your protection. And the protection that he's describing here is a breastplate that's going gonna, it's, it's gonna to protect your vital organs from any shrapnel, from any, any, any sword, any spear that's going to be launched at you. And I, I, I believe, guys, now uh, more than ever, we, we need to be putting on the breastplate of faith. The breastplate of faith, what, what, what does that look like? What, what, what is he talking about, the breastplate of faith? If, if that's something that's, that's necessary for my Christian life, then, then you know, I, I need to know what it is. And, and what it's talking about is girding your life, you know, putting around your vital organs spiritually this whole idea of living your life in faith. And where do we know faith comes from? Faith comes from hearing and hearing from the word of God. And if you want your faith to be intact, you, 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 you're gonna put that armor on, on, and that breastplate on, that means you need to be a man and a woman you know, that, are, that are putting on this breastplate daily. And Christian, I'll tell you what, man, more than ever, you need to be opening up your Bible and hearing from the Lord. You, 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 need, you need to build that faith and, and, and gird yourself with that faith around you. Hebrews 11.6 would tell us, without faith it's impossible to please God, for he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he's, watch this, a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. That's what faith does. Faith acknowledges, man, if I seek God, God's gonna reward that. And so I'm gonna take this time to seek the Lord because God is gonna honor that in my life. And so we, as the church, need to be those who are girded in faith. It's interesting, Jesus five times talked about people who had little faith. He says, oh, you have little faith. Five, five times in the scriptures, three times he spoke of people who had great faith. <laughs> See, Jesus acknowledged those who, who really had a confidence in him and in his word and in his truth, and he also acknowledged those who didn't. And, and the, you know, the question has to be asked, where do I stand in that? Do, do I have great faith or do I have little faith in my own life? And I would venture to say if you have little faith, it's because you haven't really spent time, you know, girding yourself in truth and, and you know, building up that faith. In Matthew chapter 17 and verse 20, Jesus said, because of your unbelief, for as surely I say to you, if you have faith as a mustard seed, you will say to this mountain, move from here and there and it will move and nothing will be impossible for you. Just, just, just the, ma the faith of a mustard seed. And that's the kind of faith we need to possess in the days that you and I are living in. And I think that, that's what Paul was encouraging the church of Thessalonica, but you put on the breastplate of faith in the middle of all of the things that, that are transpiring around you. Man, you need faith to be at the center of your of your life protecting you because let me tell you something, the enemy wants everything in his power to try to discourage your faith. He, he, he wants to distract you from your faith and, and you, you have to put it on every day. Putting on means that you're taking an action, you're putting on something, you're putting on your breastplate and you're you know, seeking out you know, that particular uh, uh, armor for your life, I, I, I need to grow in faith. Because I'll tell you what, what, what'll happen, man. You, you sit there and you neglect truth, you neglect prayer, you, ne you ne neglect the word, and you're just watching you know, CNN and Fox News and you're watching you know, C CNBC and all, you know, you're watching all of that. You mean tell you what's gonna happen? It won't take long before you're living in fear. Where you're, 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 you're you know, panic and, and fear are what dominate your, your mind and your thought and your heart. And the thing that's gonna combat that is that you're now what? Putting on the breastplate of faith. 
And then he tells us not only the breastplate of faith, but we're to put on the breastplate of love. Love. It's, notice, notice what he, what, how he uses both those words, putting on the breastplate of faith and love. And love is the word agape. And that word is, is, is you know, used and spoken of as something divine. It's God's love being poured out into us. And you and I are encouraged to put on the breastplate of love. And it's the evidence of, of, our, of our Christian existence. It's the evidence of our Christian life. Matter of fact, in 1 John 3, 16, we're told, by this we know love, because he laid down his life for us, that we also ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. And whoever has this world's goods and sees his brother in need and shuts up his heart for, from him, how does the love of God abide in him? My little children, let us not love in word or in tongue, but in deed and in truth. And so love needs to be part of our, 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 our plan, something we put on. And guys, I'll tell you, man, there, there's people that need to be loved right now. All around you. Friends and family and coworkers. I know there's a lot of people who have lost their job this last week. There's a lot of people that that are in need and, and you know, the reality is, is that you have that connection with them, you're aware of their need, and the real question is, is man, how are we showing the love of Christ to those around us in your neighborhood? It's, it's gonna be interesting to navigate because you know, p- part of what's happening is, is that we're to be distancing ourselves from one another, right? And, and you know, so you're going, how do I show love if I'm supposed to be separated? Now, you know what, we gotta figure this out. How, how, do we, how do we show love? You know, we don't know, are we, are we gonna be quarantined here in the next week or two? That, that's a good question where everyone's asking. Are we gonna complete, are we gonna have to close the church doors? And you know, for me, it just, like, that, that, that's, that don't even make sense. And we're, we're trying to navigate, how are we gonna show the love? We've, we had so many people this week walk in for prayer, walk in for, for food boxes, and we've been able to just you know, pray with them and love on them, and, and, and you're going, man, how, how, what does that look like now if, that, if we're going to that step? And we, we, we're, we need to navigate through it because we need to show the love of Jesus. And we all need to be asking that question. Maybe, maybe we can't do it from the church building, but maybe it's gonna be from our homes that we're having to love on those in need. And so he's, he's, he's saying, look, the breastplate of faith, the breastplate of love, and then, I love this, he from that point um, would tell us now in this next passage, watch this. And as a helmet, the hope of salvation. As a helmet, he, he, with the breastplate has, has its place to play. It, it's, it's to protect the vital organs, but the helmet, that's to protect your mind and your brain. And what does that is the hope that you have. Because if you're putting your hope in this world, guys, it, 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 it's gonna, it, you're, gonna, you're gonna lose your mind. You're gonna, you're gonna lose your mind as we're watching these things begin to deteriorate. But if you have your hope in heaven, if you have your hope in Jesus Christ, and I, I think that that's what Paul had declared to them in the fourth chapter of 1 Thessalonians, and there in the fourth chapter, beginning in verse 15, watch this, and I think it's important as, as we look at this whole picture, because he was talking about, you know, the, the blessed hope that we possess there in verse 15, he goes, for This we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means proceed those who are asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the cloud to meet the Lord in the air, and thus we shall always be with the Lord." Therefore, here it is, comfort one another with these words. And there's where our comfort is, and it's where our hope is. 
is that Jesus is coming back. Jesus is going to send. He's going to, the word caught up means he's going to snatch away. The word harpasso, or we get the word rapture from. He's going to come, he's going to remove from this world those who've put their faith in Christ. And, and, and that, that, that's, that's part of the, the, the day of the Lord. I think that, that's what, you know, begins that whole process where, you know, the church is taken out and then the seven years of God's wrath being poured out. We call it the tribulation or the great tribulation period where God is going to be dealing with, uh, you know, the, the, the world that's rejected the truth that he came to declare. And it's the hope that you and I possess. You see, I, I don't plan on being here for God's wrath. God's wrath is not going to be something that I experience or the body, the bride of Christ would experience. He's coming back for his bride and he's going to take his bride with him to heaven. And, and, and it, it, it's interesting that that you know when Paul's writing this epistle to the Thessalonians who thought they had missed the coming of the Lord and that they were living in the, in, in the day of the Lord, uh, he's reminding them, look, here's your hope. That you're not, matter of fact, that, that's the next verse that we look at there in verse nine, watch what he says, for God did not appoint us, there's the us again, he did not appoint us to wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. And, and we're, we're not appointed to wrath. And one of the things you find as you go through the book of Revelation from chapter six all the way to chapter 18, it tells us that this is the wrath of God. Matter of fact, even those hiding in the caves are saying the wrath of the lamb has come upon us. They're aware of it. Interesting, interesting. So guys, what's, what's happening right now? Just, just, just so it's clear, this isn't God's wrath yet. I, I believe it, it's God trying to wake up the church. I, I really do believe that it, it, it's God trying to say, hey, it, it's time to put on this breastplate of faith and love, to put on the helmet of hope, because all of this other stuff is, is, is deteriorating. Everything else is, is kind of, you know, falling to the wayside. Now, the only thing that's going to last is, is the things that are eternal, And my prayer is, you know, we're, we're going to, you know, a week from now, a month from now, two months from now, whatever that looks like, we're back together. And I pray that it never goes back to just the norm again. I, I pray that faith, love, and hope would be the center of our lives. And it would be, it would be, it would be, you know, something we're going, man, we, we, we got another chance. We got another opportunity. We got, we got another, you know, avenue for God to work uh, in the days that we're living in. It, it's interesting that Paul in, in Romans chapter 13, there's two more passages. I, 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 and I think, you know, the Bible often declares the same things in, in, in different ways and in different passages because I, I think there's a message that, you know, that needs to be heard in every generation, but I think it's also a message that was laid out for those that would be living in the final hours, in the final days. In Romans chapter 13, look, look at verse 11, if you would. Romans 13, 11, I just an, an one of those passages that really kind of got my attention in this whole subject. And watch what he says. And do this, knowing the time, that now it is high time to awake out of sleep. For now our salvation is nearer than when we first believed. The night is far spent, the day is at hand. Therefore, let us cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armor of light. Let us walk properly as in the day, not in rivalry and drunkenness, nor in lewdness or in lust and in strife and in envy. Look, look at this. Look at verse 14. I love this. But 
put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to fulfill its lusts. Wow. That sounds like when Paul was writing to the Romans, he was saying the same things he was, that, that he was saying to the Thessalonians. That we're, we're to know the times that we're living in, and that, that we're not to you know, slumber or sleep or just kind of walk around you know, just half-hearted in our Christian life. And I think for us, church, I think for us, it's an opportunity, man, for God to awaken every one of us. It's exciting. You know, you look around, you're kind of, you know, you, you, I don't know what tomorrow's going to bring. I don't know, I don't know what, the, what by the end of the day what it's going to happen. And, and yet, you know, you're just kind of, Lord, what do you want to do? What do you want to do in, 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 you know, the next day or two? What is it you have in store? And then, you know, really seeking God's heart and walking in the light and walking in truth and just, you know, trying to be, you know, that instrument. But also understand there, there's going to be all of these other temptations that the lust of the flesh are going to want to draw us that other way. And so his, his encouragement was, look, don't, don't make no provisions for that flesh. Don't give it any opportunity. Don't put, don't put yourself in any situation that, that it's going to draw you the other way. Put yourself in every opportunity that's going to draw you in truth and light. I find it interesting that one, one more place that those same terms that, that are used in Thessalonica and Romans and are also found in the book of Revelation chapter three. And it's a letter that Jesus is writing to the church. It's the church of Sardis there in Revelation chapter three. Now when Jesus is writing this letter, some time had passed from his death and resurrection. Some 30 years had, had gone by. And the church, uh, you know, had, had survived and it was, it was thriving for, 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 you know, many years. But after, after a, a time, it, it just kind of got into a rut. Matter of fact, watch, watch what he says to this church in Revelation chapter 3. Remember, this is Jesus writing a letter to this church. And the angel of the church in Sardis write, these things says he who has seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know, you, I know your works, watch this, that you have a name that you're alive, but you're dead. Outwardly, you look like you're awake, but in reality, you're asleep. So the facade was there that, that it, you know, everything's happening. The church was, you know, active. People, you know, oh, yeah, I go to church. Oh, I do, you know, and they, they had this whole facade. But inside, there was no life. And then, watch what he says. Be watchful and strengthen the things which remain that are ready to die, for I have not found your works perfect before God. And what was the call? He says, wake up, be watchful. Wake up. And, and what's interesting, he says, those things that, are, that remain that are ready to die. You know, he goes, look, they're, they're on their last leg. <laughs> These things, you're, you're, you're just, you're just kind of, you know, they're, they're, there's still something there, but you, it, it's just, it's, it's waning, and, 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 it's, and it's getting to the point where it, it's, it's ready to, to just kill over. And, and his encouragement, watch this, look at verse three. Remember, therefore, how you have received and heard, hold fast and Repent. Now his encouragement, look. 
You heard this before. You, 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 you know this truth. It's already been declared to you. You're, you're well aware of all of these things that, that have already been said. But he says it, it, it's time now to hold fast to those things. I mean, that means, you know what? Not just let him go into our ear, but now, you know, now living it out in our, in our, in our, in our life. Hold fast to them. And then he says, repent. That means turn from what you were doing and now begin to do the things that you were supposed to be doing the whole time. But here's the interesting part. Therefore, if you will not watch, I will come upon you as a thief and you will not know what hour I will come upon you. And guys, that wasn't just a a warning to the unbeliever. It's a warning to those who know truth. I'll come upon you as a thief. That's what he told the Thessalonians. And you're not of the night, and, and you know, you, you're, you're not going to be taken unaware you, because you know, you're of the light and you're of the day. And then in this passage, in Revelation 3, you know, Jesus is saying, hey, you're going you're gonna to fall into the same category as the unbelieving person because you didn't take heed, because you didn't watch, because you didn't repent. It's gonna come upon you unexpectedly. Just like it comes upon the whole world. Again, I, 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 I've reiterated a few times, I, I think it's God trying to wake up the church. Those who know truth, but haven't been living that truth in their Christian life. And maybe for some of us, you know, watching this morning, man, it, it, it's, you, you realize, you know what, I, 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 I've known about God, I've heard about God, I, I, I believe that he's real, I believe it's truth, but you haven't yet surrendered your heart and your life and said, God, I, I, I'm ready to surrender my life. I don't want to play the fence, I don't want to be in darkness and then, you know, come and dabble with the light, I, I, don't, I don't want it to be, you know, this, this half-hearted commitment so it's almost like a slumber that I'm living in I want it to be I want to be awake I I I want I want to be living in truth I want to be living in the light I I want to see God work and I want to be part of what God's doing and if that's where you've been Christian can can I encourage you repent if you're if you're if you've never given your life to Christ can, can I encourage you man it's today's the day Right now is the time. You can be born again and invite Jesus Christ to be your Lord and Savior at this very moment. As you, by faith, just say, God, I, I'm guilty before you. I'm a sinner, and I need, to, I need to ask Jesus to come into my life and forgive me, and then now fill me with his Holy Spirit. And so I, I think God wants to use this time to get our attention, all of us, mine, yours, I think the world's. And if you're here, if you're listening, if you're you know a part of this right now, man, and you know, man, you know what? I I I, I need to take heed to the things that God is saying to me, and I want to pray with you. And I'm going to pray a simple prayer: as you, by faith, invite Jesus Christ into your life. And if you've been walking with the Lord, man, and you need to repent, then it's time to repent, then let's do that as well. It's time, it's time to, to come out of our slumber and just say, God, I, I, I'm, I'm ready to live a life that's under your rule and under your authority. I surrender. And let's pray that prayer. If that's you this morning, would you join in? And let me ask you this. We're going to say this prayer. And after we say this prayer, if you've made that decision, man, we want to get you, um, you know, a Bible. We want want to make sure that we have someone reach out to you to encourage you and get some some information to help you in this journey that you begin this morning. And so you you can send us an email at info at ccrgv.com. And and man, we'd love, love 
to con you know connect with you, or you can let us know on Facebook or, or on YouTube, and you know and give us give us information to get a hold of you, and we'll be doing that shortly. So that that that's that's just a matter of you know you following up in this decision you're going to make right now as you've just invite Jesus Christ into your heart. So would you, if that's where you're at, would you pray this prayer from your heart to God? That, let's go before Him together and let's pray, dear God. I confess to you that I'm a sinner. And I thank you for sending Jesus, that he died, that he rose from the grave. Lord, all of these things that we've looked at this morning, I, I, I want to ask you, to, Lord, to put me in the light, to fill me with your spirit, and to guide and direct my life. And God, I just ask for your help. And I ask for your forgiveness. And I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you guys.